Tell me if this sounds familiar. You decided to check out that popular young adult dystopia series everyone was talking about for a while? Nope, not that one. Not that one either. Or that one. Or that one. Or that one. Or that one. Or that- Wait, yeah, that's the one. Or maybe you're not much of a reader and you watch the movie version instead. But as you kept reading or watching, you were struck by just how much of the plot is shrouded in mystery. You continue on hoping to find answers to these questions, but if anything, the story only gets more mysterious, with each answer only raising new questions, and the mysteries keep piling up and piling up until your brain starts to hurt keeping track of it all, and you get to the end and you're like, help, I need someone to explain this to me. Fortunately, that's why I'm here. The Maze Runner is part of a genre that I like to call the mystery box story. Definition on screen. And I've dedicated myself to explaining as many of them as possible. If you have unanswered questions about the convoluted lore of a story you just finished, then I'm the guy who can give you those answers. Then afterwards, I give each mystery box story a rating out of 10, using my 10 criteria for what makes mysteries like these fun and engaging. In this video, I'm going to attempt to give a comprehensive explanation of every single mystery and question you could possibly have about this story. So, let's get ready to run into this maze of a plot and figure out the story of the Maze Runner. The Maze Runner is a young adult novel series by James Dashter. It ran for five total books and spawned a trilogy of movies. Some people accuse it of riding the YA dystopia trend, piggybacking off the popularity of books like The Hunger Games. I think this is a pretty unfair analysis. One, the first Maze Runner book came out in 2009, well before The Hunger Games and dystopias really blew up. And two, there's a lot here that makes The Maze Runner stand apart from the average dystopia, mainly his approach to world building through mystery. The readers and the main character are thrown into this world with basically zero information and have to piece it all together from scratch. It uses a mystery box form of storytelling to paint a unique and compelling picture of this broken world. So what the heck is this story about? What happens in it? And how does it utilize the mystery box formula of questions and answers to push the story forward? That's what I aim to find out. By the way, even though we'll be using clips from the movies to give this video some kind of visual, I'm primarily focused on the books. The movies are fine, I guess, but they're way more action-focused and tone down the mysteries to the point where they're almost non-existent. So let's stick to the books where there's actually something to analyze. The story begins with our protagonist, a boy named Thomas, getting dropped into a strange, isolated community called The Glade, full of only teenage boys. All the boys, including Thomas, have had their memories wiped, so they don't remember anything about the world outside The Glade. We meet a few notable characters, Albie, the leader, Newt, a friendly guy who everyone seems to like, and Chuck, the sort of little brother of the group, who follows Thomas around like a lost puppy. The Glade is surrounded by a huge structure called the Maze, which is, well, a giant maze that closes its doors every night and rearranges itself. It's full of stuff that'll kill you, most notably the Grievers, mysterious creatures that act like the maze's security guards. The boys think that the answer to escaping this place lies somewhere in the maze, so every morning, they send maze runners in to run through and map it all out. Besides the obvious questions of what the heck this place is and why they're all here, Thomas and the audience have lots of other details to chew on. There's clearly some intelligent force behind all this. Somebody is sending them resources and more kids. There are these robo-bug things called beetle blades that say Wicked on them that seem to be watching them. Wicked seems to stand for World in Catastrophe Killzone Experiment Department. After Thomas arrives, a girl shows up named Teresa, the first girl ever. And she's holding a note saying, she's the last one ever. She spends the first half of the book unconscious, so we'll check back with her later. There's a character named Gally, whose entire personality is basically just abrasive jerk. He's really suspicious of Thomas because apparently, if you get attacked by a griever and live, it brings back some of your memories. This happened to Gally, and he has vague memories of seeing Thomas before he came to the Glade so Gally thinks Thomas has something to do with the reason why they're all here. A kid named Ben also gets attacked by a griever, and goes crazy and tries to kill Thomas, because just like Gally, he saw memories that showed Thomas putting boys in the glade. Minho, the leader of the runners, finds a dead griever. He takes Albie to check it out, but the griever wakes up and attacks Albie. Albie and Minho try to make it back out of the maze before the door is closed for the night. They come really close, but don't get there in time. Thomas makes the impulsive decision to slip through the doors to join them right before they close. This should have been a death sentence for all three of them, but they outwit the Grievers and survive the night. Since Albie survived the Griever attack, he's been acting defeated and depressed. 
Something in those memories he got back messed him up. He also becomes the third character to say that he remembers Thomas working with the creators of the Glade. This is officially confirmed when the unconscious Teresa starts talking to Thomas telepathically, telling him that the two of them were part of creating all this. When Teresa wakes up, her memories get wiped like everyone else, but not before she writes, Wicked is good on her arm. Thomas decides to let a griever attack him so that he can get his memories back, and finally sees for himself that he and Teresa created the maze. It's all still fuzzy, but he remembers that the maze is a test of some kind. Thomas and the gang go over the maps of the maze, and they figure out that if you layer them on top of each other, they spell a series of words. They go through a hidden passageway in the maze and input those words into a computer that unlocks the way out, while Elby sacrifices himself to distract the Grievers. They escape the maze to find themselves in some kind of wicked science lab, except it's in ruins. Then Gally shows up, mind controlled by Wicked somehow, and he shoots Chuck. The boys are rescued by a group of soldiers who finally explain some details about why they were in there. The outside world had been destroyed, first by a bunch of solar flares that burned the earth, and then by a deadly plague called the Flare that makes you go insane. Wicked is an organization dedicated to finding a cure for the Flare by analyzing the brain patterns of kids. The maze was designed to stress test them in order to map their brain patterns. That's the end of book one, and just because Thomas and the others are out of the maze doesn't mean the danger is over. In the second book, The Scorch Trials, the Gladers advance to the next part of Wicked's test. They're told to cross the Scorch, the part of the earth that's burned by solar flares. Wicked also tells them that they've all been infected with the flare, and if they make it through, they'll all be given the cure. The night before they head out, Teresa disappears. In her place is a boy named Aris. When Thomas talks to Aris, he discovers that there was an entire second maze, only this one was full of only girls and Aris was the only boy, called Group B. Everything that happened to the boys also happened to the girls. Aris is their version of Teresa, and there was another girl in the other group named Rachel who was their version of Thomas. But she was killed by a girl named Beth, their version of Gally. That same day, the boys all wake up with tattoos, and Thomas says, to be killed by group B. Hmm. They travel through heat, storms, and crazy people who have lost their minds from the flare, called Cranks. Lots of them die. Thomas finds Teresa for a minute, but she's being mind-controlled like Gally was, and she tells Thomas to run away before she hurts him. Eventually, they team up with two cranks still in the early stages, Jorge and Brenda. Thomas and Brenda make an immediate connection with one another. She seems different from the other cranks, less crazy. Suddenly, Teresa contacts Thomas telepathically. She warns him that some weird and terrible things are going to happen, and that no matter what, Thomas has to go along with it. The next day, Teresa shows up in person with the rest of Group B and captures Thomas. We find out that Wicked told Group B that they had to kill Thomas to get the cure. And Teresa is acting like she hates Thomas more than anything else in the world. Luckily, Thomas convinces them not to kill him. But then Teresa takes him anyway. She starts babbling nonsense about how they were never really friends and they have to do what Wicked wants. She subs Thomas into some kind of high-tech prison where he gets knocked out. But then after that, he wakes up and Teresa greets him and she's back to normal again. She says she only acted mean because Wicked said that they would kill him if she didn't do exactly what they said. The reason Wicked did this was because they needed to have Thomas experience the feeling of true betrayal, for whatever reason. At this point though, both Thomas and the audience have had 10 levels of emotional whiplash. Teresa's good, no, she's evil, no, she was just pretending, she lost her memory, she was being controlled, she always had all her memories, she was doing this for his own good. Neither us nor Thomas has any idea what to think. But one thing we know for sure, one thing that always stays consistent with Teresa, is that she believes Wicked is good. Anyway, at the end of book 2, they fight some monsters and make it to the safe zone. A guy from Wicked greets them, and says their tests are over, everyone can relax. Just kidding, Thomas goes to sleep and suddenly he hears Brenda's voice in his head. Then he wakes up in a white room and the book ends. In book 3, The Death Cure, Wicked finally explains what the point of all these experiments were. All the kids were chosen because they're immune to the flare. Since the virus affects the brain, these trials were all about stimulating different pathways in the mind to see how their brains resist the flare. Except Newt. He was part of the control group, and he's not immune. So he definitely has the flare now, and he's screwed. Wicked offers to give everyone their memories back. Everyone says yes except for Thomas, Minho, and Newt. They escape with the help of Brenda and Jorge, who were never really cranks at all but plants for Wicked who decided to turn against them. After they break out though, they hear that all the other kids independently led their own breakout, led by Teresa. Which is weird because Teresa was just talking about how much she trusts Wicked and that everyone should go along with what they want. The five of them go to the nearest city, Denver, Colorado. There, they meet up with The Right Arm, a rebel group dedicated to fighting Wicked. 
and Gally is there. He broke free of Wicked's control. The right arm has been monitoring the disappearing of immunes all over the city as Wicked collects more test subjects for more experiments. And they have a plan to send in the main cast as a Trojan horse to infiltrate and destroy Wicked. The right arm also links them up with Teresa and the others. Teresa says she's against Wicked now, but Thomas has his doubts. During all this, they get separated from Newt. Later, when Cranks overrun Denver, they find him again, only he's almost completely lost his mind from the flare. Newt begs Thomas to kill him, and Thomas does. As per the right arm's plan, Thomas turns himself into Wicked. Wicked says that after everything, they're this close to a cure. All they need is to remove and dissect Thomas's brain. Thomas does consider it, but then he's like, Wait, that's dumb. So he breaks out, with the help of Wicked's leader, Chancellor Page. Thomas and the others go rescue all the newly captured immunes, who are being held in the maze as a start of new trial, and they all escape as the right arm blows up the whole place, but Teresa dies in the process. Everyone escapes and begins to construct a new civilization of all immunes, ensuring the survival of the human race. This book ends with one last curveball. A memo from Chancellor Page that confesses that it was Wicked that originally released the flare onto the world, as a method of population control during the Sunflare disasters that then got way out of control. That's the end of the Maze Runner trilogy, the three books in the main story. But those aren't the only books in the series. There are two prequel books. The first is The Kill Order. It's not super relevant for our purposes. It takes place during the early days of the Sunflare disaster, and it follows entirely new characters who we never see anywhere else. Mainly, it shows the precursor to Wicked releasing the Flare Virus. The characters of this book encounter a girl named Dee Dee, who is the first known immune. They get her to safety at the end, and in the book's epilogue, we learn that Dee Dee is the young Teresa. The second prequel is The Fever Code, which is much more important. It follows Thomas and Teresa as they come to work for Wicked and design the maze. It tells the story of how Thomas was taken from his sick parents at a very young age and indoctrinated into Wicked's mission. The not-yet-Chancellor Page is assigned to be his guardian. When Thomas meets Teresa for the first time, he has a strange headache, which turns out to be the brain implant that lets the two of them communicate telepathically. He also gets together with all the other kids, Albi, Minho, Newt, and the others, becoming friends before they all got their memories wiped. By the way, Sonya, one of the leaders of Group B, is revealed to be Newt's sister. Thomas watches all the boys go into the Glade, and first encounter all the weird maze stuff for the first time. There's also a guy named Nick who is a kind of leader figure in the Glade, but he's not in the first book, so presumably he died, but we don't see how. Halfway through, all of Wicked's leadership gets the flare, including Chancellor Anderson, who leaves behind a memo that rambles about how this whole search for a cure is pointless and cruel. Thomas, Teresa, Aris, and Rachel have to kill all the infected and continue the trials with the now Chancellor Page. At the end of the book, Thomas decides he's had enough, and he hatches a plan with Page and Teresa to enter the Glade with their memories intact, intending to break them all out. But Paige and Teresa betray him, drug him, and send him in with his memory wiped. Then the very end drops the biggest reveal of the book. Teresa never got her memory erased. The whole series, she had been lying about losing her memory, and she pretended otherwise to gain Thomas' trust. Lastly, there are a few supplemental materials. There is the Maze Runner Files, a collection of documents from Wicked. Most of what's in here was later repurposed for the Fever Code, making it redundant. And there's Crank Palace a novella about Newt during the time where he was off on his own during the Death Cure. As for book canon, that's it. But there are also two graphic novels that serve as prologues to the second and third movies. And that's everything. Sorry, what? You're kidding. Shoot. Um, well, I've got a schedule to keep, and... Yeah, that book isn't even out where I am. So why don't you read it and tell everybody if there's anything important in it? Alright then. Yeah, I kinda had a feeling. Like, where does the series go from there? Great. Okay then, moving on. When it comes to these explainer videos, sometimes there are tons of details and questions that I have to go over. 
Sometimes all I need to do is put the plot in chronological order, and that clears up almost everything. Sometimes the story just doesn't give many answers at all, and I'm forced to speculate. And sometimes, I just need to reassure you all that, no, you're not missing anything. Just take everything at face value, there's nothing more to it. Like, take Wicked's whole mission to find a cure for the flare. Why was this their plan? You might have finished reading feeling like you missed some things. Why did they erase memories? Why does the design of the Grievers feel so specific and purposeful? Why can Grievers sting people and give them their memories back? What about those floating balls that eat people's heads? The bulb monsters? Why do they mind control Galley like a puppet? Why implant Thomas and Teresa with telepathy devices? Why build a maze in the first place? It feels like there must be a concrete reason for all these hyper-specific design choices. But no, the deepest explanation we get for all these things is that they're meant to stimulate the brains so that Wicked can map their neural pathways. No explanation as to why they require so much torture and murder as opposed to, like, showing them pictures of cute puppies. It all leaves Wicked's entire plan feeling very... underpants gnomes. Phase 1? Torture children. Phase 2? Phase 3? Profit! To be fair, there is an in-universe explanation for how chaotic this all was, but it does require some speculation and reading between the lines. You'll notice as you read that not a single character outside of Wicked has any faith that they'll find a cure. Chancellor Anderson's last words basically admitted to running a wild goose chase. And let's not forget that they freaking created the flare in the first place. You get a lot of hints that for all their confidence, Wicked has no idea what they're doing. My interpretation is that Wicked is the most powerful organization in the world backed by unlimited resources and run by the most influential people on the planet. That led to a sense within the organization that it was too big to fail. They had to be able to cure the flare, even if that was impossible. This caused everyone involved to develop an almost religious faith that these experiments would work, no matter how ridiculous their plans got. Remember, Wicked is good. Besides all that stuff, easily the biggest and most confusing question about the story is Teresa's motivation. Which is not an easy thing to untangle. But basically, she's totally drinking the Wicked Kool-Aid. She never had her memories wiped, and she's always working to carry out Wicked's will among the Gladers. She cares about Thomas a lot, but her main priority is to find the cure, and she's completely willing to hurt Thomas to do that. But like... Okay, my very first video on this channel was about how lying works in fiction. Basically, if a character is going to lie, there has to be clues and markers in the story for the audience to figure out that it's a lie before the story reveals it. It works just like any plot twist. You have to foreshadow it first. You can't just have a character go, Oh, that thing I said before was a lie, with no setup, because then the audience will go, Well, why should I trust or care about anything else the story tells me? And these books are a very clear example of why. As an example of how to do this right, look at the Wicked stuff I was just talking about. Wicked keeps saying that these experiments will work, they'll find a cure. But the reader can look at all the stupid stuff they do and realize that they're full of it. On the other hand, Teresa. Teresa tells so many lies. She lies about losing her memories. In the second book, she lies about hating Thomas. She lies about turning against Wicked after, quote, getting her memories back in the third book. There's that weird moment where she says that Thomas did some horrible thing to her in the past but won't say what, which appears to be completely made up. It's not just her either. Jansen lies about giving a cure to anyone who survives the Scorch Trials. Brenda and Jorge lie about being cranks. And people from Wicked keep telling Thomas that he was super gung-ho about their mission before his memories got wiped, even though we see in the Fever Code that he clearly wasn't. Although that's more like a case of James Dashner bending the canon to make the prequel work. None of these lies have any setup, no hints that they might be lies beforehand. The Teresa keeping her memories thing is especially egregious. This is a bad twist, no bitching words. If it were a good twist, there would be hints sprinkled throughout the main trilogy that Teresa knows more than she's letting on. But even after reading through the entire series twice, I couldn't find anything that remotely qualified. This would be bad enough in any story, but it's especially bad in a mystery box story, where readers are encouraged to keep an eye out for little details that pay off later. All of this leads to that sense that you're missing something, when, no, they were just lying. That's all it was. Don't lie to me! Don't lie to me! Okay, with that off my chest, let's go through a couple of smaller mysteries. Next, speaking of hidden motivations, what's the deal with Chancellor Page? Why did she help Thomas escape? 
Well, she did believe in Wicked's central mission, but presumably somewhere down the line, she lost faith in their ability to find a cure. She realized that using the immunes to repopulate the Earth and save the human race was a better option. It wasn't because she felt anything for the kids or felt bad about experimenting on them. No, this move was purely utilitarian for her. Then what about those soldiers who rescued the kids at the end of Book 1 and then suddenly get killed at the beginning of Book 2? The story never really addresses them again after they all die. It would make sense to assume that they were members of the right arm, but you'd think that would have come up when Thomas talked to them. This is a case where the movies can actually help us. The movies changed the scene to make it explicit that these soldiers were just also a part of Wicked, sent to give the kids a false sense of security. So I'm inclined to believe that this is also true in the book. That would also mean that Wicked killed their own people, but that's par for the course for them. And in case anyone was curious about this, I'm going to do a count of how many gladers survived until the end of the books. Not including Teresa and Aris, there are 19 boys alive at the beginning of the Scores Trials. Nine make it to the end of that book. Then in the Death Cure, Newt and one other boy are revealed to be not immune and eventually die of the flare, bringing us down to seven. Add Galley back to that since he never actually died, that leaves us a total of eight. Thomas, Minho, Galley, Frypan, a guy named Clint, and three unnamed kids. We don't get a clear count of how many unnamed ones survive the final battle, so the final final count is between four and eight. I've been talking pretty much exclusively about the books so far, but it's time I address the movies. I would not call these successful adaptations, and if that's all I had to say about it then I wouldn't bother. The thing is, I think the reasons why they're bad adaptations are because of the mystery box elements, so I want to talk about why. On the surface, you'd think that the Maze Runner books would be pretty easy to adapt. They're action-heavy kids' books. But when you watch the first movie, some problems become apparent. The first book has so much exposition. The maze, and the memory loss, and all the characters, and the grievers. Exposition takes up like half the book. Movies have way less time to play around with when it comes to that stuff. So the broad strokes are all there in the movie, but it had to cut a lot. The biggest loss is the whole plotline with the griever serum giving people their memories back. I totally get why they cut it. It's a lot of detail to get through. But as an unintended consequence, that totally ruins Albie's storyline. Since Albie can't get his memories back, there's nothing for him to do, so he just gets randomly killed off. Get the lock. <laughs> Making the entire mission to save him a few scenes earlier feel completely pointless. For the most part though, the first movie makes it work, but you can almost feel the frustration of the writers juggling what info dumps to include and what to cut. By the second movie, they just gave up on following the book entirely. The next two movies go off and do their own thing. Besides the broad premise and a few details, movies 2 and 3 have nothing in common with books 2 and 3. All this is a great lesson about mystery boxes, and why they don't tend to show up in movies very often. With limited time to play with, movies just can't fit that kind of detailed plot that a book or a TV show can. So I was disappointed with the movies, but I understand. Okay, we've talked and talked about the questions in these books, but are these questions engaging? Do they make the story more entertaining? Number one, is there an obvious opening mystery? Yeah, a ton. Thomas gets dumped in the maze with no idea what it is or why he's there. And there are tons of confusing details about the maze that get dumped on the reader. The whole first half of the book is basically just about raising these questions. All of these questions are tied together by Wicked's plan and these questions are immediately presented in a way that gets the reader wondering. I wouldn't describe it as long. It's five books, but those books are pretty short, even by young adult standards. It's in the pacing where I think the mystery box stumbles the most. The story front loads a ton of questions in the first book. Then once the major questions about the maze are answered at the end, the next two books have simultaneously not enough mystery and too much. Besides some of the finer details about Wicked's plans and whatever Teresa is up to, there aren't many questions to wonder about, and those questions aren't even fully answered by the end, making the readers wait for a prequel before it all makes complete sense. Everything that happens is part of the story world. Thank Apollo that the series didn't go in the same route as something like The Fifth Wave, another young adult dystopia where very little makes sense. That would have been so frustrating. When you read all the books in the series, yeah, basically everything important is explained, 
But the thing is, again, a lot of the answers are in the Fever Code, the prequel, instead of the Death Cure, the ending of the story. This robs the story of that ultimate high you can get from a mystery box story where all the dominoes fall at the same time and the mystery and plot resolve together. Do the mysteries feel set up in advance? Kind of, but... Sure, the general idea of Wicked and their experiments was obviously present from the beginning, but when it comes to the answers in the Fever Code, so much of that book feels off. Between Thomas being a lot nicer than he was described, and the stupid reveal that Teresa never got her memories wiped, most of this book feels like it was made up after the fact, so I have to dock a point. And finally, is the mystery tied to the characters? Ooh, this was tough. Sure, the characters are asking the same questions as the audience, and the answers directly impact their lives. That counts for a lot. But at the same time, this is a very plot-heavy, fast-paced story. A lot of the time, the story doesn't give us a chance to know the characters that well. Most of them are pretty two-dimensional. Minho is bold and aggressive, Chuck is like a little brother, Yali is abrasive, the people at Wicked are cold and calculated, and Thomas is more or less an everyman without a lot of strong defining traits. It's also really weird how basically no time is given to anyone outside the half dozen major characters. Like, it's insane that there were gladers that made it all the way to the end and never got named. There were multiple occasions where the book was like, a boy lay dead. Thomas didn't know his name, they didn't ever really talk. How does that happen when there are less than 10 of you left and you survive like a hundred near-death experiences together? Then there's Frypan, whose entire purpose seems to be to make sure that Thomas and the audience still care about the background people. Frypan is always grouped with the unnamed kids. And every time they're in danger, Thomas is like, Oh no, not Frypan! And I guess those other guys too! But the story's biggest failure on that front is with the death of Newt. When Thomas was forced to kill him, I didn't feel that strongly about it. The plot was always moving, moving, moving all the time, that it never gave me a chance to know him all that well. The books kept telling us that Newt was a super nice person who everyone liked, but it didn't do nearly enough to show that. Crank Palace was good about it, but that came too little too late. These books fell into the same pitfall that so many other mystery box stories do. They got so wrapped up in the plot and mysteries that it left character development behind. Before I go, let's check out some tropes. Those story elements that seem to show up in every mystery box story I cover. The big shadowy organization running things is wicked, obviously. There's a non-linear story structure in the flashbacks where Thomas regains lost memories, and in the two prequel books. The character who knows everything we want to know is Teresa. She remembers everything. And to a lesser extent, all of Wicked also fills this role. The closest thing we get to a conspiracy board is the Maze Runner files which has that same effect of a chaotic and disjointed collection of information. And there are a couple of moments where Thomas is about to learn something important, and then the person telling it to him dies. Mainly, Alby sacrificing himself to the Grievers before saying what he remembered, the soldiers who all get massacred the day after they save the kids, and Teresa, whose dying words almost kind of confess to all the lies she told. These books aren't that deep. Which is okay, they're for kids. But I couldn't help but feel myself wanting more out of them both when I read them as a teenager and again as an adult. The story attempted a lot of cool things, and is a solid early effort at writing a mystery box in book form. I can recommend these if you want action and creative world building, but when it comes to unraveling grand conspiracies, this story could have been better. The Maze Runner gets a final mystery box rating of 5 out of 10. What? So, Kenho, let's not jump the gun here, alright? Alright? 